All right, good morning. It's good to be at Fellowship Baptist Church once again, and it's even better to have my family with me this time. And uh, for those who do, may not know who we are, my name is Jim Heverly, my wife Becky, and my son James, and the daughter Lydia. And uh, we live up here not too far away, about 25 minutes north in Kalanga, and uh, we attend the uh, New Beginnings Baptist Church in Mango Hill, if you're familiar with that area at all, North Lakes area, not too far from here. It's good to be back here at Fellowship, and... Uh, Good to see you folks and uh, fellowship a little bit, and uh, good to have, uh, good to see Brother Rivo and of course uh, some of the younger folks that were with us out west in the Word for the West back in April, and uh, so good to see you guys again, and we're going to have another one coming up soon in about three weeks' time, so if you're able to be with us uh, on the 21st through the 26th of July, uh, we're having a uh, bit of a, a mini team from America come over, uh, eight of them, eight uh, different uh, uni members and uh, university uh, students coming over and going to join us for another Word for the West happening not too far from here. Last time we were in Emerald. It was a bit of a drive. Uh, this time we're going to be based out of Dolby, so not too far from here. So that's happening 21st to the 26th of July in about three weeks' time. They'll be here arriving in Brisbane. Then we'll drive out to Tarum, uh, which is about a uh, six-hour drive from the airport. And they'll be visiting and ministering in all of our three different Outback churches. And then we'll be... Uh, do a little bit of an outreach in Sherberg, and uh, a bit of a, uh, a kids' club happening there. And I know uh, uh, Tass is familiar with that town and being from there and grew up in that area. And it was good to have her uh, with us in Eidsfold uh, back on Mother's Day a few months ago. She came out and had a, a special Mother's Day banquet on Saturday. We had like 30, 32, 33 ladies and girls show up for that, and Tass was a special speaker for that. So that was wonderful having her there and giving her testimony how she received Christ and Great time, the ladies, and uh, so if you would keep that in prayer, if you would, those dates, and uh, if you're able and willing to come out and join us, please do. We'll be evangelizing those areas of Dolby and er other areas. We have uh, about 9,500 packets of gospel literature ready to go, and so we're just waiting for some manpower behind that to distribute that, that literature, and so uh, thank you so much uh, for your prayers for that, and uh, this morning we're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Now, is this a little box? Is this on? Working? Okay, no worries. John chapter 3. Gospel of John and chapter 3. Very familiar story here this morning. And I can't recall what time you guys usually end up uh, finishing up. Is it? When we're done. Okay, I like that. That's a good, uh, good way to put it. When we're done. <laughs> we'll finish up when we're done. John chapter 3. And very familiar story here. Gospel of John. I'm sure we all have heard this uh, story of Nicodemus, and uh, we're going to look at it a little different light this morning and uh, see what God has for us from John chapter 3. Now, understand the Gospel of John, there's two concepts that help us understand the purpose of the Gospel of John. In fact, when I just mentioned that we have uh, about 9,500 packets of information ready to be handed out, in that packet is a, co is a copy of John and Romans, and very familiar, you know, uh, compilation. It's the Gospel of John, the book of Romans. And the Gospel of John is very, very straightforward. And there's two concepts to help us understand the purpose of the Gospel of John. And first of all, it is number one, the proof and evidence and, def and defense of the deity of Jesus Christ. All right, very, very important to know that uh, you must believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And on top of that, number two, it has a evangelistic aspect. Our understanding that He is, in fact, the Son of God, He is deity, is so that we can believe in Him and have eternal life. So very, very simple two concepts help us understand the purpose of the Gospel of John. All right, so what I'm going to do this morning is right off, is give you the three points, the three outline points, and then we're going to go back and, uh, and kind of uh, dive into a little bit deeper. So we're, we're going to read the first ten verses of John chapter 3. And the three points are these. So if you're taking notes, you can write these right down real quick. And uh, the first uh, point is the sinner's problem. The sinner's problem is the first thing we'll cover. And then secondly is the Savior's prescription. The Savior's prescription. And then number three is the Spirit's provision. All right. So that's the sermon. All right, we're done. We can go home. <laughs> All right. We're not done yet. All right, so uh, sinner's problem number one the Savior's prescription, number two, and the Spirit's provision, number three. All right, so hopefully I'll help you understand a little bit in this 10 verses of John chapter 3. 
Let's read this together, and then uh, we'll start breaking this down uh, verse by verse. Here in John chapter 3, verse number 1, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Within this passage here, we have five different times the phrase, born or born again. Now, I'm sure we all have all heard this phrase, being born again, a born-again Christian. Very familiar phrase, very uh, evangelistic phrase, and it probably is very much needed today since Christianity is a very broad term. Everybody says they're a Christian. And so being born again is Bible. The phrase is, it's not just some cliche, it's actually it's God's words. He spoke himself. Being born again. Being, so what does this mean, being born again? It's a very, very familiar concept to most believers. And evangelists and preachers for decades have called for people to be born again. In fact, there's books and, and all kinds of material out there to understand how to be born again. What does this mean, to be born again? How can we understand what Christ meant by using this phrase, being born again? Now, before we get into it, let's look a little bit this morning about Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, everybody knows about Nicodemus, all right? We know uh, his name, very familiar name. And uh, maybe not today so much. We don't really, I don't think I've ever come across a fellow named Nicodemus. Anybody ever hear, know of a, a friend of yours, Nicodemus? No, not really. I guess the closest name we've come to is the word uh, Nick, N-I-C, for Nicholas or Nick. Uh, actually, the word Nick means victorious over the people. So Nicodemus, uh, you get the word Nike from that. Nike, the sporting clothing. Nike is, uh, means victorious. What a great name for a sporting company. You want to be victorious as you go out and you know, do your uh, sport and, and, be, and be vic- have victory in that arena. But his name means triumph or victory. All right, In the Greek, it means victory over the people. So Nicodemus is a Pharisee. All right, He's a Pharisee. Now, we're familiar with Pharisees. All right, And uh, sometimes when we uh, you know, may joke with our friends, we say, oh, you're being a Pharisee. It's not being a Pharisee. You know, they're being a hypocrite. They're being not somebody who's real. They're being phony, being false. All right, so Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a very elite group of students of the Old Testament who obeyed the law fastidiously, all right? I mean, very fastidious, very to the T. They, they crossed their T's, they dot their I's, very detailed in how they obeyed the law of God, all right? They were the most devoted of all Jews to the Old Testament, and every bit of their Jewish tradition. They were isolationists. They want nothing to do with the, the people, the populace. In fact, later on in the Gospel of John, you'll find that they deem the entire population apart from themselves to be cursed. All right, so they are very elite, religious, uh, hypocritical, very, if you would see them on the street, you could recognize them right away. They, they wore certain clothing, and they thought they were better than everybody else, and uh, that's why they were called whitewashed on the outside, but Christ said they were full of dead man's bones on the inside. All right, they, they pretend to be very religious and lead people to heaven. In fact, what does Christ say about them in Matthew 23, 15? He says this, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Exclamation point. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold, twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He's saying, Christ is saying, guys, you're leading people astray. You are leading people astray with your theology, with your law abiding, and all the stuff you got going on. The Pharisees are about maybe 6,000 of them here at this time in the land of Israel. Again, they were the most devoted, the most conscientious keepers of the law. Not only the, the law of the scripture, but all other laws that they made up. All right, we could spend, there's thousands of laws they had made up about the Sabbath and all kinds of stuff going on. And we're not have time this morning to uh, dive into that. But the, the word Pharisee actually comes from a word means separated. 
All right, they were separated people, separated from the rest of the people by their devotion to the law. Separated from sin, so they thought. Separated from evil. They were, in fact, at the very heart of apostate, corrupt Judaism. And they were the people Jesus was assaulting when he went into the temple in chapter 2 and made a whip and started throwing people out of it. It was their system that he was assaulting. All right, so Nicodemus is a Pharisee, all right, he's one, but he's not only that, he is the top Pharisee. All right, he's the top of the ladder, top of the pile. Verse number 10 says, he is a, Are thou a master of Israel? He's a master. He's not only a teacher, he is the teacher of Israel. You can't go any higher than Nicodemus. If you want to learn the ways of the Pharisees, learn the, 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 uh, the law and all the different fastidiousness of the law, he's the guy to go see. He's the guy to teach you all the different details of the law. He knows it. He is the teacher, the master in Israel. He's the most illustrious, the most noble of teachers. He's the master teacher. In fact, he's a part of the Sanhedrin, a very specialized group of the Pharisees, the Council of Seventy. All right, very, very elite group of people that were the Supreme Court of Israel. He's way up there. You can't go any higher than Nicodemus. He's an Old Testament expert. He's intelligent. He's bright. He's immensely successful. And his wisdom, his ability to think and reason and do his business had made him extremely successful and wealthy. He had it all. He had it all. And here's his problem. He has it all. He's rich, he's successful, he's wealthy. So where does he go to? Who does he go to? He's top of the ladder. Where does he go to? He's the teacher. Then he comes across Jesus, and guess what? Jesus is a higher teacher at a higher level than he is. Because Nicodemus, and we'll break this down in a minute, but he noticed Jesus Christ, he says, I know there are a teacher come from God because you're doing some miracles I've never seen before. So... Jesus Christ has one up on him, looking, through, looking to Christ through the eyes of, of Nicodemus. And his heart is crying out in reality. Let me give a little bit of a, little bit of a background here. Let's read verse number uh, 23 of chapter 2. because This will lead us up to chapter 3. This is very important to understand what's going on here. Chapter 2 of John, verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem, speaking of Christ, was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, Many believed in his name, okay, look at, it doesn't stop there, it's not a full stop, it's a comma, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Interesting, okay? These people understand that Christ for 30 years lived a life in basically uh, in isolation. Not until his baptism, when his public baptism, did he, people start taking notice of him. And all of a sudden, here's a man on the scene it's been silent for 400 years. The man is seen doing miracles. They've never seen this before. We don't know all the details. And, you know, Christ performed miracles over spiritual issues, over health issues. And so we have this taking place. And he did miracles. This, this is a feast day. Not, it was many weeks, by the way. The Feast of Unleavened Bread followed this. And so this is the first uh, Passover that Christ attended. And of course, the last Passover, you know, he was the sacrificial lamb. So we have Christ attend the Passover, and many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Okay, notice verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. What does that mean? Christ did not believe in their believing. He didn't believe in their believing, okay, because they didn't have faith, believing faith to save them. They were simply believing Christ as a miracle worker, as a teacher, all right? But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he still knows all men. He's deity. He's God. He knows the heart of men. We don't know your, I don't know your heart this morning. You don't know my heart this morning. Hopefully you do a little bit by, seeing, by hearing the words of God being, being spoken. But the thing is, you know, Christ knew all men. He, he knows their motive. He knows why they believed in him. It wasn't for the right reason. It's a place to start. It's a place to start to understand that, you know, God is, is a teacher sent from, uh, Jesus Christ is a teacher sent from God. It's a place to start. In verse 25, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Okay. Christ knows. He, he knows. He, you can't pull a wool over Christ's eyes. He knows your heart. He knows your motive. He knows your intent. 
Now that verse in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is sharp, quick and sharp and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces the dividing of the Son of being soul and spirit and discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. To know that Christ's word, God knows your intents of your heart. He knows who you are. So that's kind of the backdrop. And, and then we read verse number 1 of chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. All right, so here's Christ. He's got his people with him at the Passover. Um, many believe in his name. They believed in him, but Christ did not believe in, in their believing. He didn't have faith in their faith. All right, so the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3, then, is an illustration of chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. All right, so we have that mindset taking place. And so here we open up the story in, in verse 1 of chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was there at the Passover. He saw the miracles of Christ, a ruler of the Jews. We understand who he is now. Okay, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. All right, so here's number one, like I mentioned earlier, the sinner's problem. The sinner's problem. All right, it, he was speaking not only for himself, but on the behalf of the people that were there. He says, Rabbi, we, we know that thou art a teacher. We believe Jesus, that you are a teacher come from God. Why? For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. All right, Nicodemus, he, he, he knows. He's a smart guy. He's, he's wealthy. He knows the Old Testament law. He goes to Jesus by night, calls him rabbi. He understands the position Christ has. So he's saying that to Jesus Christ. Nicodemus is saying, Jesus, a rabbi, master, teacher. I know you're a teacher. But you have one up on me. Something's different here. We know you're a teacher come from God because you're doing miracles that only God can do. All right, so they're just, they, he came to him with this mindset. This mindset. We believe you come from God as a teacher. That's a place to start. Good place to start, but it's not saving faith. And why do we believe that? For no man can do these miracles except God is with him. God is with him. And here's a man, Nicodemus, who took religion to its apex. He took religion to its highest level, to its most noble level. He reached the very pinnacle of his religion. He's fastidious. He's detailed. He was the guy who tithed little tiny herbs, but his heart was full of fear. And he wanted more information about Jesus, so he comes as a worried sinner. He comes inquiring. He comes asking he comes giving Christ a title. He comes giving Christ a level of authority in his life, but he wants to know more. He wants to know more. Uh, Rabbi, we know, and I know, that our teacher come from God. And the sinner's problem is this. You know, an irreligious, atheistic, openly immoral man has fear. They have fear of judgment but not nearly the level of fear that an elevated hypocrite has because he's done everything he knows to do. And when the fear and the dread and the reality that he doesn't know God, it, when that hits him, he has nowhere to go because he's reached his peak. And that's Nicodemus. He's not an immoral man. He's not wicked. He's very religious. And he's very fastidious. He, he, he knows what he needs to do. He knows about heaven. He knows about hell. He knows the Old Testament scripture. He knows what the Bible says about a prophet named Jesus, about a son of God named Jesus. He knows that. But he's nowhere else to go. He's the teacher. He's nowhere else to turn. And this, is what, this is the spot we find Nicodemus in. He approaches the Lord. He has fear. He has fear. He has dread. The sinner's problem. And folks, every sinner has a problem. The problem is their sin. And Nicodemus here, he knows where to go. He had nowhere else to turn. But he saw something in Christ that was different. And that leads us here, number two, is the Savior's prescription. And I love this here. So we have, and I, when I read God's word, I often try to put myself there in that situation. You think of Nicodemus, and it's nighttime now, and he approaches Jesus Christ. And, and uh, if you're a fly in the wall, I'd love to be a fly in the wall, as they say, and just be there and observe this conversation and see what's going on here. 
and understand that Nicodemus gives Christ respect. Rabbi, thou art a teacher come from God. Okay, now, verse number three is Christ's response to this. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, does that seem like a little bit of irrelevant comment to you? I mean, he really didn't even acknowledge what Nicodemus said to him. He totally ignored what he said. All right? And uh, I think if that would have been me, I said, oh, thanks a lot, Nicodemus. I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that you know I'm a, t I'm a, I'm a teacher and uh, come from God and I have some authority. I'm, you know, and I'm so happy to know that you believe that I come from God and I'm a teacher and I appreciate it. But Christ totally ignores what he says. Totally ignores what he says and says this in verse number 3. The reason Christ said that was because he knew the sinner's problem. He knew the heart of Nicodemus. The point that needs to be made is that what Nicodemus said wasn't important to Christ. It was what Nicodemus was thinking that was important. And that's the whole, that's the whole, thing, that's the whole thing right here. Christ knew, <laughs> Christ knew, got past, he cut through all the formalities of stuff. He got right to the heart of the issue. He totally ignored what Nicodemus said. And he went right to the heart of why he was there to begin with. Nicodemus, you can't do anything. And what he's saying here in verse number three, truly, truly, I say unto thee, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this phrase, kingdom of God, was mentioned in our, in our group this morning, men's group, our, our adult group here this morning. And it can be, like uh, Brother Neville said, can be a little bit of a phrase that can be a bit shied away from, but it, 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 kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, these are all biblical phrases, biblical words. This is what Christ is dealing with. The kingdom of God is more of a broader context. And Christ is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, what you need to do is go all the way back to the beginning, start all over again. Now, understand that Christ is the master in everything. He's the master teacher. And teachers, what they do they tend to lead their students. They don't always tell them exactly what needs to be said. They lead them along for self-discovery. This is what Christ is doing here to Nicodemus. Christ is using an analogy, using illustrations, using parables. And that's, parables are chock full in the Gospels. Christ spoke of parables all the time. Because parables paint pictures. They're like windows that light, let light into the, into the topic and shed light in the conversation. Help you understand what Christ is talking about. So here we have a parable, we have a, an illustration, and we have this analogy Christ chose about being born. Being born. The very idea of being born, again, is completely alien to anything that a sinner could do. And that's why Christ chose this analogy. The whole point of this illustration of being born again is to demonstrate that Christ is saying something has to happen to you that you can't do that you can't contribute to in any way. The analogy describes a spiritual reality to which the one born makes no contribution. Understand, I was born on the 3rd of June. All right, I won't tell you the year, but I was born 3rd of June last century. All right, I had, I had no involvement in when I was born. I just, it just happened. I had no contribution to that whatsoever. My, you know, it, 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 your birth the same way. You had no contribution to when you were born. It happened to you. It happened to you. That's physical birth. None of us had any contribution to our physical birth, none whatsoever. All right? Same as spiritual birth. This is the analogy Christ is trying to teach Nicodemus. All right? New birth happens to us, not by us. We receive this birth from someone else in the same way that we receive our physical birth, physical way, from someone else. Birth happens to us and not by us. And that's exactly the point of this analogy. Understand who Nicodemus is. And I love how Christ contextualizes his, his evangelistic efforts every place he goes. He knows Nicodemus. He knows that he's, a, he's a, a, a moral man, a religious man. He knows he knows the Old Testament. And so Nicodemus, he's saying, all oh, that's trash, that's all rubbish, that's all garbage. In fact, if you would turn to Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and Paul, and also a Pharisee, said the same thing. Keep your finger there in John chapter 3, and we'll turn to Philippians chapter 3.
Philippians chapter 3, and uh, let's read a few verses here. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 4, we'll start there and read a few verses following. Verse 4 of Philippians 3, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. <laughs> Paul's saying, look it, if I trust in my flesh, like Nicodemus, to get myself to heaven, to merit the kingdom of God, to merit eternal life, I'm the guy. I'm the guy who trusted in my flesh. And he goes on to describe his credentials, his pedigree. There in verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So we don't have to, this is uh, a long list of pedigree for Paul. And he says, if I was a guy to trust in myself to get me to heaven, to marry eternal life, I'm the guy that was going to do it because I have, a, I have a complete and perfect pedigree. All right, what he says in verse number seven, look what he says. But what things were gained to me, these things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He did a swap around. Things were gained to me. You know what? These things are now in a loss column. And those things that I thought were lost were now in a, in, a, in a gain column for me. Yea, doubtless, verse 8, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. He said all that religious garbage was just that. It was rubbish. It was dung. It was excrement. It was a waste. That was a waste. I was trusting in all this religious stuff to gain, to merit the kingdom of God, to merit eternal life. That's all rubbish. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And this is what Nicodemus is at this point right now. He's come to Christ inquiring. It's a <laughs> you watch people inquire. You watch their heart take a step forward. What is this all about? This is what Nicodemus is doing right now. He is just like Paul, Paul like Nicodemus, a very religious Pharisee, a hierarchy in their sect. Back to John chapter 3. The words of Christ here in verse 3 are telling Nicodemus that you must be born again. He's simply saying that there's nothing to add because nothing you've done matters. Nothing you've done matters. You understand this morning? I don't know if you're seeing a little book called Done. It's a, it's a little, little booklet, maybe 85 to 100 pages long. And we use this book called Done uh, by a fellow in America named Kerry Schmidt. And uh, it's a great, great tool for those who are like Nicodemus, inquiring, wondering. We're very religious. We use this a lot in, in our Outback uh, churches and to know that people are searching and they want to know that uh, the whole book, as the title implies, done, it's, it's already been done for you. Nothing you can do can merit the kingdom of God. And so this is, if, you know, that book was around during Nicodemus' time, you know, and Christ wasn't there, we can give him a book, you know, read this book and understand that Christ has already done it for you. He's done it for you. But nothing, you can't add anything, nothing you've done matters. It doesn't matter anything. In fact, you're there in John chapter 3, turn to John chapter 1. I love this right here. I love this right here. This is John 1, verse number 12 and 13. One page over to the left, John chapter 1, verse 12. And it says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Understand, that, that's a phrase right there I can preach all day. To understand that God's given you the power to become sons of God. It's your individual freedom of choice to become the sons of God. All right? He's given you the authority to do that, even to them that believe on his name. Now, verse 13, which were born, here's this word phrase, born, born again, which were born not of blood. All right, you don't inherit eternal life because your father is saved or your mother is saved, your family is saved, it doesn't mean you're saved. All right, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. Nothing you can do. Nothing you can do will merit you eternal life, nor the will of man. No person, organization, religion, 
uh, church can merit you eternal life. But of God. It's of God only. Of God only. And Nicodemus had to understand that. Nicodemus, everything you've done is, is rubbish. It's dung. It's, it's waste. It's excrement. We don't, it's nothing. It's worthless. Let's get rid of it. Nothing you've done matters because new birth happens to you, not by you. It's not by you. What makes it clear to us is that salvation is not for those who become more religious. It's not for those who try hard to become good. It's not for those who live morally improved lives. It's not for those who turn away from certain vices. It's not for those who diminish evil behavior and escalate noble and good behavior. Salvation is not for those people. The kingdom of salvation, the kingdom of God, open this door only to people who abandon all of that. Who abandon all of that. Who get rid of it, who turn their back, repent of all that. And turn to Christ alone. In other words, Nicodemus, you have to delete your entire life. Hit the reset button and begin all over again. Now notice the, uh, the conversation here in verse number four. <laughs> Nicodemus being a smart fella, he's he a sharp cookie, he understood what was going on. Nicodemus understood that Christ has read his mind. He got caught, all right? He was trying to present one thing, but he knew this man named the rabbi, the teacher from God, the miracle worker, just read his mind. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? So what's he's, he's using, he understood Christ using an illustration to him. So he's taking the same illustration that Christ used to him and turning back to Christ. How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time his mother's womb and be born? He knows Christ has read his mind, his heart. And this man lives in a world of analogies. He's a teacher of Israel. He's a master teacher of Israel, understand? He lives in a world of illustrations and parables. And he jumps right into the third person discussion and he says here, how can a man be born when he is old? He's using, he said, all right, Christ, I'll use your analogy. That proves that he totally understood what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, you come into the kingdom, but you can't do anything about it. All right, Christ, you're telling me it's humanly impossible to achieve the kingdom of heaven. You're speaking of something that's impossible to me. And I really don't think, and I've heard, you know, it may be the case, but I don't think he was being sarcastic. I don't think he was being smart. I just simply think that he was understanding that Christ first of all read his mind, and then secondly that, uh, you know, he, it hit him that, you know what, okay, there's something that I can't do, something that I can't do. Now, it's inexcusable that Nicodemus doesn't understand the new birth. In verse number 10, as we read earlier, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? So Nicodemus has no excuse. He knows the Old Testament Scripture. By the way, Old Testament Scripture proclaims the name of Christ. All right? And, and, and Nicodemus would have known this. There's no excuse why Nicodemus should not understand the new birth. But it's going to help him. And I love this, because Christ, again, leads the teacher. He leads this man along. And he gives him two hints. All right, hint number one is verse number five. And he says, uh, gives a, a bit of a, a again, another uh, an, an illustration, maybe an open window, an open door for Nicodemus to help him understand what he means by this. And, not, and uh, hint number one comes to verse number five. It says there, Jesus answered him again, Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right? So hint number one is there in verse number five. Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, understand that Nicodemus would know the Old Testament inside and out. He probably had many, many scripture passages memorized. He was the teacher in Israel. He was the top dog in his, in his class. And Christ knows what he knows. And so Christ, uh, I believe what he made reference to is Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. If you would turn there, if you would, back in Ezekiel uh, 36, 25, in the, one of the Old Testament prophets. Let's see what a uh, little bit of an explanation here of this uh, 
born of water and of the Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 25. All right, again, you understand this is the, you have to place yourself there and understand the Bible's written, you know, it was written for us. It wasn't written to us. All right, it was written for our learning. And we understand uh, a lot of these things, you place yourself in that conversation and know where Christ is going with this and understand who Nicodemus is. He's a teacher, a rabbi, he's a smart guy. He knows the Old Testament. Here in Ezekiel 36 in uh, verse number 25, the prophet Ezekiel said this, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you should be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statues. And he shall, ha- and shall keep my judgments and do them. And he shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and he shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness." Notice those words here in in this passage, water and spirit. Verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. You should be clean. Nicodemus, you have no no excuse not to understand what I'm talking about. You understand the prophet Ezekiel. Prophets are given to uh, proclaim the message of Christ and keep the law. Nicodemus, you you have no excuse. You, You know what Ezekiel said. You know he talked about water, that I will cleanse you with water. I will put a new spirit within you. Verse number 27, and cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgment and do them. You see, uh, Nicodemus, you have no excuse. You know what Ezekiel said in the Old Testament law. So that's a bit of a hint that he was given to Nicodemus. He said, truly, truly, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, and he basically quotes Ezekiel, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And hit number two is verse number six. All right, before we move on to there, again, the water and the Spirit is simply a reference to the creation, the new creation, the work of God that he does in the heart of a sinner. And that was the first hint. Second hint, verse number six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he says, (laughs) Nicodemus, verse 7, marvel not. Don't be amazed that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Don't be amazed. Nicodemus, you should know this. You should know the Old Testament. You should know what it says. So hint number 2 is in verse number 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Nicodemus, all that the flesh can produce is what? More flesh. That's it. You can't get flesh to spirits. You can't do that. What he's basically indicting Nicodemus for, is, for, is a failure to understand the Old Testament doctrine of sin. and It's there. The doctrine of sin is in the Old Testament. Now, Nicodemus, how can you be the teacher of Israel and not know about New Testament salvation by the washing of the word and the giving of a new heart? How can you not know that, Nicodemus? How can you not know that? When he mentioned there, verse number 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Maybe his mind went back to the book of Genesis. If you would turn there, Genesis chapter 6, in the very start of creation. The book of Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis 6, in verse 3, we'll read a, a couple of verses here. This is the, uh, the Savior's prescription, all right, under the, uh, point number two. Here in uh, chapter 6 of Genesis, in verse number three, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is what? Is flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Drop down to verse number five. What does flesh produce? And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what flesh produces right there. All right, flesh begets flesh. You can't get spirit from flesh. Nicodemus, you don't have no excuse. You should understand what, what the, the first book of the Pentateuch, the law of Moses says about this regarding sin. All right, flesh produces flesh. That's it. 
And then uh, he could have also referenced Job chapter 14, verse 4. He won't turn there. Job 14, 4 says this, Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean, not one? Nicodemus, don't you know what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64, verse 6? All our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's what the uh, prophet Isaiah said. You have no excuse, uh, uh, Nicodemus, why you don't understand this. You have no excuse whatsoever. Man needs a complete spiritual birth. He needs to be washed. He needs to be transformed. He needs to have a new heart. Uh, he has an old heart replaced with a new heart. And that is not something you can do, Nicodemus, because you are flesh, and so are we this morning. We're all flesh. And flesh produces flesh. So, Nicodemus, how can you be the teacher in Israel and you not know this? Christ does not let him off the hook very easily. He does not let him off the hook at all. He's hammering him. Now, verse number 7 again. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Now it's in second person. He changes it to second person. Ye, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. You're not going into the kingdom until this happens to you, and you can't make a contribution because you're flesh. And flesh can't do this, Nicodemus. Then thirdly and lastly this morning is the Spirit's provision. The Spirit's provision. So, how does a person get saved? How does a person enter into the kingdom of God? Nicodemus, don't be amazed. He must be born again. You should know this. You should know exactly what I'm talking about. And Christ helps him again in verse number 8. He gives another illustration. And I just love the balance. I mean, <laughs> being God, he, look, Jesus Christ is he's perfect in balance. He, he gets to the point... He, uh, he nails Nicodemus yet with love. He helps him understand what he's talking about. Here in verse number 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. All right? So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Understand, we, have, we can't control the wind. You know, you can't write a book on how to, to improve wind in, in, your, uh, in your community. You know, it, it just comes, and we have windstorms and cyclones, and we can't control that, and... It just comes and goes. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. We're a recipient of it. So we feel the effects. We see the effects of the wind. We see the trees swaying back and forth. We see trees being knocked over and rubbish being blown all around. We see all that happening. But we can't control the Spirit. So this is another analogy that takes spiritual birth completely out of the hands of the sinner. This is a Spirit's provision. We can't control the wind. The wind's invisible, it's uncontrollable, it, it, it's unpredictable. It can't be summoned. It doesn't show up because you want it to. It doesn't go away because you want to get rid of it. And so, this is the second analogy that Christ uses with a sharp, smart-thinking, logical rabbi to tell him that it's, it's a work in which he doesn't participate. It doesn't, he, doesn't, he, he, he doesn't understand it. it. It's the Holy Spirit, it's provision. It's the work of the Lord. In his heart. He would turn to Mark chapter 4. To the left, Matthew, Mark chapter 4 and verse 26. And this is, uh, again, another parable that Christ speaks here in Mark 4, 26. And through verse 29. And he said, and he says, so is the kingdom of God. All right, same topic we're on with Nicodemus, kingdom of God. As if a man should cast seed into the ground. Again, another parable, another illustration for us to understand what he's talking about. And should sleep. So the kingdom of God, should, a man cast seed into the ground, and should sleep and rise night and day. And a seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. We don't know. We don't know where the wind's coming from. We don't know where it's going. So is the spirit of God. All right. He, we, we, don't, we don't understand what's taking place in, in a person's heart, a transformation of the Holy Spirit, when a person places their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. For the earth, verse 28, bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Uh, Nicodemus, it's the work of the Spirit. It's a Holy Spirit moving. 
Okay, there's nothing you can do. It's like you were born physically. You had no, idea, you had no contribution to that whatsoever, Nicodemus. You had no a part of that. So you were just simply born. And so is it like spiritual birth. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Do that again. Go back to the beginning. Start again. You must be born again. It's the Holy Spirit. It's his provision. It's his working. And thou art a teacher, a master of Israel, and knowest not these things. You say, what happened to Nicodemus? I believe, and uh, I, I, I can't really 100% prove it to you, but there's some indications that uh, Nicodemus is in heaven today. And let's turn, if you would, to uh, chapter 7. Let's fast forward about a year. All right, so this is the uh, first encounter that Nicodemus had with Christ. All right, and then we fast forward a year in chapter 7 of John. <clears throat> And uh, we'll skip around to verse, uh, various different verses here in verse 28. All right, then this is a year into Christ's ministry. And then cried Jesus, verse 28 of John 7, in the temple as he taught, saying, You know, you both know me, and ye know whence I am, and where I am come of myself. But, ye, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. But I know him. For I am from him, and he hath sent me. So he's, he's declaring his deity to the people in the temple. Then they sought to take him, because, uh, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour is not yet come. All right, they want to take him. They want to take him away. Ver, drop down to verse number 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So there's a big ruckus going on. It was mayhem. People are just, you know, Christ is speaking and preaching. And, and just put yourself in this crowd of people. It's mayhem. Some are yelling, crucify him. Get rid of this guy. Let's tackle him. Let's get rid of this guy. He, he's speaking blasphemy. Some, uh, he may be the Christ. We don't know. It, it's going on and on. And then verse number 42, hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. So Christ caused a division. There's chaos going on, pandemonium happening here. And some of them, verse 44, would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. They want to grab this guy and kill him. This guy is irritating them. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees. Interesting, here are the Pharisees on the scene. And they said unto him, why have ye not brought him? All right, so what's happened, the officers were sent to go capture Christ to bring it back to the, the priests and Pharisees, they came back empty-handed. All right, and the officers answered, never man spake like this man. He said, this guy is speaking with authority. He's speaking like nobody else we've ever heard before. We can't grab this guy. In uh, verse number 47, then answered them the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Sarcastic, are you going to follow this too? There's a lynch mob going on here. Are you going to follow us what's going on? Are you, are you being deceived too? The officers. You guys being deceived by this man? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? Have, have any of us believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. All right. Verse 50. Notice what it says. Nicodemus saith unto them. He's, Nicodemus is trying to calm the crowd down a bit. Say, guys, guys, hold on. In parentheses, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them. I guess a little, little uh, commentary on who this guy was, Nicodemus, that we read in John chapter 3. He, verse 51, notice what Nicodemus says to these guys that are bickering back and forth, they're arguing. He says, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? He's, Nic guys, it's Roman law that we first have a, a system of justice to hear this man first of all before he tried to accuse him. So Nicodemus now is standing up for Christ. Interesting. I, I don't think he's saved right here, but he's, <laughs> it's a year on down the road. He's moving on in his journey in his life. And guys, guys, settle down. Our, our own country law said we have to first hear this man before we accuse him of anything. All right, so he's sticking. And then answered, verse 52, and said unto him, Art thou also a Galilee? So now they're criticizing and throwing sarcastic remarks towards Nicodemus. Search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. All right, so they're going back and forth. And every man went unto his own house. So you have a little, little skirmish happening here. 
<laughs> and Nicodemus stands up for Christ. Fast forward another two years, if you would. Uh, chapter, chapter number uh, 19. And we'll close with this. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. <clears throat> this is after the crucifixion. So this is about three, three and a half years after the first meeting of Jesus Christ. There at, at nighttime, Nicodemus and Christ met for the first time. There in chapter 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for the fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes in a hundred pound weight. It's about 35, 40 kilos of, of, of spices and embalming and, 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 and uh, lotions and all that to help with the body of Christ. Then they then took they both Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, the body of Christ, Jesus, and wound it in the linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. So here we have the end of Christ's life, his, his physical life, his body, with Nicodemus and Joseph taking care of the body of Christ. And uh, why, why would he invest so much money and cost and time in taking care of a body he didn't care for? And uh, I, I believe Nicodemus, you know, that encounter with Christ that night really opened up a door in Nicodemus in his life. It was one step at a time. It took about three years. And uh, we don't know when exactly Nicodemus accepted the Lord in his heart. But it's a spirit's provision. And the challenge for you this morning is this. We all have a problem. It's called sin. It's called sin. And nothing you can do can merit eternal life. It can't. You cannot gain the kingdom of God. You must be born again, like Christ says. You must be born again. And follow the Savior's prescription. It's through the Holy Spirit, the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You must place your faith and trust in Him. Maybe you are saved this morning, and maybe uh, you, know, you have someone, a loved one, relative, a neighbor, that's going, you know, maybe like Nicodemus, they're religious, they go to church, maybe they don't, maybe they're, they're irreligious, maybe they're, you know, just a heathen living in the world, unsaved, come across people like this all the time. And maybe, you know, they're searching, they're looking. And hopefully something this morning through God's word was said to help you, to help present the gospel, the good news of salvation to those around you. We live in a dying world, a very needy world. And uh, we need to be on, on the alert, on the lookout for those who need to hear of the gospel message. And that's why we're going out in a couple weeks to spread the good news. Tell people, you know what? Nothing, you, can't be really, you can't go to church enough. You can't be good enough. You must be born again. Start, just remove all that stuff and start from the beginning. Start over again. You must place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ in Him alone. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you for this encounter <clears throat> that happened with Nicodemus so many, many thousands of years ago. And Lord, how it teaches us today, how it's an encouragement to us today to know, Lord, we live with, with people, work with people, live next to people that may be religious. Lord, that they're, they're lost. They haven't placed their faith and trust in you. They've placed their faith and trust in their own works. And Father, I pray you help us as we think about these things from Nicodemus and Lord, we thank you for just reading how you dealt with this man and Lord and how we receive the same treatment from you, Lord, with love and truth, Lord, and a, and a perfect harmonious balance. Lord, you love us enough to tell us the truth. Lord, you are the truth. And Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, help us learn that as we deal with people around us. To, yes, to uh, help them understand the truth in love and in illustrations and parables and analogies that, he, that, that you have so often have done there in the writings before us this morning. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. I pray that anybody here is not saved, that they don't have their assurance of salvation in you, that today will be the day of their salvation. And Father, we thank you for this time. In your name I pray. Amen.